So I think what's important here is we have very similar effects with psilocybin ingestion and meditation, reducing the activity in this default mode network of the brain. Now, what's also interesting to me is that this is directly correlated in these studies with the sense of unity consciousness or ego dissolution that the person experiences in that state. So we're putting third and first person perspectives together to show the validity of the data. So let's continue now to our next spoke of our wheel examining the fundamental nature of consciousness. And actually I just um, uh, went on, but I want to talk about our two different questions that we're gonna be looking at. The first is, can consciousness remain when the heart and the brain have stopped functioning? And are NDEs real or as the skeptics say, are they hallucinations? And I believe that recent studies from both the first and the third person perspectives looking at NDE research suggest that they cannot be explained by a Newtonian worldview. So what I wanna do next is tell you a case study of a person who was an MD, Bettina Payton, who had been an avowed materialist during her MD career until she had her near-death experience. And I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment again, just to tell you a little bit about that story. So she, again, as I said, was an avowed materialist until she had this near-death experience during the birth of her third child, which was delivered by cesarean section. Payton says she lost consciousness under anesthesia until she heard a voice. Her blood pressure is too low. She says, my anesthesiologist's alarmed voice had snapped me awake as if from a deep sleep. Suddenly in the middle of the operation, I was wide awake. I was super aware and attentive in a way I'd never been before. She said, he, she heard him say, how's it going? The anesthesiology was asking the surgeon how far along he was in the delivery. He exclaimed that her blood pressure was plummeting fast. She says, in the next instant, a strange stillness spread inside my chest, a hollow feeling. My heart had stopped. At the same time, my vision opened and I discovered that I could see into the room. How amazing, she said, the eyelids on my physical eyes had been taped shut to protect the corneas. Yet by some other mechanism, I could see perfectly clearly. Several units of blood were hanging from an IV pole directly over me when already being transfused. Then there was a volley of strident beeps. It was the cardiac monitor indicating her heart had stopped. And Peyton watched the anesthesiologist slam his fist into a large red button on the wall. He was calling a code that was gonna culminate in the arrival of the hospital resuscitation team. Now there's more to the medical drama that was unfolding, but let's now look at another part of Bettina Payton's experience, her feeling that she was about to die. She says, I see in my inner vision, a vast darkness expanding behind me at the backmost boundary of my mind. My awareness reaches the edge of the precipice and I let myself fall gliding downward in a graceful backward arc into the unknown. She says, laced within the black darkness were particles of shimmering light. She sensed a pervasive presence in that light, an intelligence, a pulsating power. And she said she was deeply happy, enveloped in peace. She said all was perfect until her experience was interrupted by a statement, you must live. And she says, funneling down through the darkness, her consciousness opened up into the confines of the hospital operating room. She said, my surgeon was working in a surgical field filled with blood, performing what he would later call was his first three minute hysterectomy. She says, my attention was then drawn to a white haired gentleman in scrubs, a senior surgeon entering the room. He wove a path through the crowded room coming to her right side. Without a word, the elderly surgeon reached deep into her blood-filled abdomen. He located the aorta, wrapped his fingers around it, clenched his fist, and clamped the aorta shut. Shortly after that, one of the nurses leaned over and whispered into Peyton's ear that her baby had lived. She had a healthy daughter. 
When Peyton later opened her eyes, she was in the critical care unit, lying in a bed encircled by her husband and that team of doctors and nurses. She still had a tube in her trachea so she couldn't talk, but she put up her hand to keep people from speaking and she motioned to be given something to write with. Before anyone spoke, Peyton had written on a napkin words to this effect. I know I had a baby girl. I know my uterus is out. I know my heart stopped. After her NDE, once Peyton awoke, she was utterly convinced that consciousness is primary. In her words, when I woke up in that intensive care unit, I had vivid recall of everything that had happened. My perception was, as it still is, that I am not this body, this individual, and that consciousness is real and is the substratum of everything that exists. And I should mention that she actually went into hospice care after that experience in her career, and she wanted to help people that were on the edge of moving to the other side of the veil. And she said when she walked into the room, people could feel her lack of fear of death when she went to help others out because of that near-death experience. Now, what I wanna do next is show you some of the data from, in fact, um, the scientific research now that we can um, see that has been done by a number of laboratories. And I'm gonna shift now to the research by, first of all, Pin Van Lommel. But I wanna say that um, you've um, certainly heard him talk here on this particular series, but also Bruce Grayson and Sam Parnia and Peter Fennick have each done similar sorts of studies. There's a lot of research that supports this um, information that we're gonna to present today. What I want you to notice is that this was a prospective study, which is the gold standard of studies in this area. When we say prospective, we mean that at a particular um, set of 10 hospitals in the Netherlands, everyone that ha had cardiac arrest was brought into the study from a particular date and time until they had all of the data they needed collected. And what they found when they did this was that 12% of those people had a core NDE. And one quarter of those people actually watched and recalled events during their cardiac arrest with no brain activity. And Pim Van Lobel concludes at the end of this wonderful article from the Lancet Journal, again, ranked number two of all of the journals in medicine. He, he says this, he says, the thus far assumed but never proven concept that consciousness and memories are localized in the brain should be discussed. How could a clear consciousness outside one's body be experienced at the moment that the brain no longer functions during a period of clinical death and flat EEG? And now my next question is, what would we see happening in the default mode network of the brain during an NDE? Now, I wanna remind you that we don't have brain scan data on near-death experiences because we can't put someone in the brain scan during cardiac arrest but we know the default mode network is deactivated because the entire brain cortex is deactivated and even the midbrain and the brainstem. And in the next slide, we have data from Pin Van Lommel of what happens in the brain in its activity during an NDE. What we're looking at here is EEG from the cortex and ECG from the heart during cardiac arrest. And what you can see is the heart rhythm is going along normally until a particular point here in um, part B of this graph, and then the heart stops. Now you notice that then the brain activity continues on for a number of seconds until at about 20 to 30 seconds later, this activity stops too, and now the brain activity is flatlined, meaning now the person has no perception coming in from the senses anymore. The brain is not working. So I, to me, that really shows me that in fact, in three cases that we've talked about so far, meditation, psilocybin, and near-death experiences, that default mode network is turned way down or it's turned off. And that's when we have these mystical experiences occurring. So what I wanna do now is shift to the next spokes of our research wheel and discuss evidence for the primacy of consciousness um, from research on healing and on the placebo effect. And we're gonna look at additional evidence to support the primacy of consciousness.